Welcome to the Old Man of the Three with JJ Reddick and Tommy Alter, presented by Cash App and brought to you by 342 Productions. This is episode 104, Willie Green. Tommy, this is part three of our coaching series presented by the Future Fit app. Willie Green is one of the greatest human beings to walk the face of the earth. I'm convinced of that. I've I've known Willie a long time. Great human being and, and possible uh, coach of the year this year. We get into it with him, but who? not many people have done a better job than him. I, I agree with you. And given the advers- adversity that New Orleans has faced with Zion being out all season, their 1-12 in start, the turnaround there has been amazing to watch. And I'm just excited for Willie. And, and we get into a ton of stuff in this conversation with Willie. Uh, lessons learned during his playing career, influences on his coaching philosophy, his time in Golden State with Steve Kerr, his time in New Orleans and Phoenix with Monty Williams and Chris Paul, and what he set out to do in his first head coaching job. Tommy, if you picture the most successful people in sports and fitness, and then you look at the person right next to them, there's something in common. They all have a great coach. The Future Fit app is bringing a human touch to digital fitness. Your coach is a real person who is invested in your success and ready to provide their expertise and support through your experience. Again, this is human-to-human contact. Tommy, I know you signed up with your coach a few months ago. How's your training program going? It's going great. I mean, I can speak to it. it having a real person there uh, you know, rather than sort of some automated system is ex- extremely helpful because they push you. You, know, you need that jolt sometimes. Future has over 3,000 five-star reviews in the App Store. Future members love the experience and say this is the most consistent they've been with their fitness in years. And if you're ready to invest in your long-term health and wellness, you can get started with your future coach right now with 50% off your first three months at tryfuture.com slash old man. Again, that's tryfuture.com slash old man. Episode three of our coaching series with the great Willie Green brought to you by Future. All right, let's welcome in New Orleans Pelicans head coach Willie Green, friend of mine, uh, known each other a long time. Willie, thanks so much for joining the show. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on, Jay. Um, I was thinking about this in preparation for the show, and that first year that I played for the Clippers – uh, you were on the team. Jared Dudley was on the team. Jamal, of course, was on the team. And it was a, a frequent occurrence for us on bus rides. The four of us would huddle up somewhere in the bus ride, and we'd put our GM caps on, and we'd talk about stuff around <laughs> the league. Transactions, yeah. p- players' values, would you trade for this guy? And I find it crazy. It's actually crazy to me that Nine years later, basically, uh, none of us are working in a front office. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Shows you how much we we thought we knew about being uh, GMs or, you know, working in the front office. But it's fun. It's fun to, to play that play that role. And but it, it's it's there's definitely a lot of work that goes into it. When did you when did you decide or sort of sort of get the itch to to coach? Was that while you were still playing, or was that in that year you took off? You know, I, I think it was evolving as I was getting towards the end of my career anyway. Um, you know, you get to a point where you're not playing as many minutes, and you have to ask yourself as a teammate, what can I do to help the team? Uh, and, you know, if you're on a veteran team that's, you know, keeping some of the hot-headed guys in, in, in check, <laughs> if you want to um, – a young team that's helping helping young guys get in the gym, spending extra time. So all all of those things lead to coaching. Uh, I did, still didn't know that I wanted to coach, but it actually hit me. And this was literally Tara hit me um, when I took the year off. We were in a car in New York and she said, hey, what are you going to do? She just like elbowed me. Uh, and she said, right now is the time to start calling around and seeing if there are some opportunities for you if you want to coach. And I was like, okay. And I got on the phone right away and made some calls. And and that's what kind of led me down that path. Did you have a favorite coach when you were playing? 
a coach you just sort of felt like you learned more from than than maybe sort of the others? Well, the the coach that impacted me the most, and, and it's not an NBA coach, but it's my uncle. Um, he's he he raised me. He started coaching me when I was a young young kid, uh, and so you know he passed away uh, a year a year a year and a half ago. But he was the guy for me. Um, so it's often been said that great players, Hall of Fame level players, don't make good coaches. There's probably some exceptions to that, but more often than not, former players that are really good coaches are role players. Why do you think that is? Uh, you know, I, I think it's the lens that uh, role players are able to see the game through. And I, I wouldn't necessarily go down the road and say that Hall of Fame players um, aren't great coaches or can't be good, great coaches, but I think the reason that we see more role players is because they can see the game from several different lenses. Um, at one point, being a starter or not playing at all or playing 20 minutes a game or playing 15 minutes a game or, you know, the different struggles that you have to go through uh, and the different joys that you go through throughout the course of the season. A role player experiences a lot of those, um, have those uh, have those different experiences. And, and sometimes Hall of Fame players, star players, you know, their role is tough, but it, it's, it's one role and this is who they are. And, and they're that for the most part of their careers. I think the other thing, the other component to this, and you, you touched on this and I, I witnessed it firsthand, especially with your relationship with CP when we were all together with the Clippers is role players who establish themselves as leaders in a locker room are inherently doing what a lot of the NBA head coaching job is, yeah. and that's managing relationships. Was that a natural thing for you to do as a player, or did that skill evolve over time? It was it was more natural to me. Um, I, I pretty much was a role player my whole NBA career. So, you know, <laughs> you're managing. You averaged 12 one year. Yeah, I did. That's a role player in the NBA. That's a role player. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good role player. Um, but you're, you're managing the, the locker room. You're managing coming in and spending time with guys that aren't playing because maybe there's a few games that you, you're not playing as many minutes. Yeah. And so it's, it's, it's spot on with the fact that you have to manage uh, a ton of different scenarios, players, yourself, talk to the coaches more, training staff. So it's just more that goes into it in terms of on in terms of managing personalities. Do you guys do you guys think, JJ, to your point, do you think part of this might also just be bouncing around to these different situations? And certain star players, you know, if you're a max guy and you get drafted to a certain team, there's a chance you're there your whole career. You know, and so being thrown into different locker rooms, you're gonna it's a little bit of like a a sink or swim, you're going to have to get along if you're going to, you know, be with these guys for a year or two. Yeah, there's some trial by fire there. I, I, I also, the NBA is such a star driven league that a program's orbit generally revolves around the star players, and some of them, and I've been around some some really good ones, are aware of all the stuff that's happening. They're they have great empathy for the guy on the you know, the end of the bench who hasn't played in three weeks. They have great empathy for the two-way guy who's coming in two hours before practice, getting an hour of court work, and then doing the same thing after practice. Um, but a lot of times, there isn't that awareness, and so they're, they're never really forced to navigate relationships and navigate locker rooms in the same way that uh, guys – I think I played for six teams. Willie, I think you played for five – when you're moving around and your role changes year to year, it's the interpersonal stuff that you really have to rely on in order to function as a role player. Absolutely. Totally agree. Um, Willie, I want to get into more of your coaching career, but there's a couple stories from your NBA career that I would just like to highlight. And you guys recently traded away Josh Hart and Nikhil. Um, 
for CJ, you know, well, McKeel went to uh, ended up going to Utah, but you know, in the CJ McCollum deal, and you spoke about this after the trade and just the business of basketball and what Josh and Nikhil meant to the program as you s- started to establish this culture this year. Um, and as a player, you were acutely aware of the business of basketball. And the one story I, I, I really want you to tell is when you sign your long-term extension with Philadelphia and then subsequently what happened after that? Uh, in terms of uh... the, the injury. The injury. So, yeah. um, so really what happened was um, I was the second round pick in 2003, uh, one of the best draft classes, by the way. And um, we, uh, you know, I played two seasons. And at that time, second round picks could get to free agency pretty quickly. So in two years, I was restricted free agent. Had a, you know, at that time, a pretty solid five-year deal on the table. And I was at home planning a pro-am like working out, getting ready for the season, playing a pro-am. At the same time, my agent was negotiating um, the contract for with with, with Philly for me. And uh, I go to a Saturday game at St. Cecilia Gym, a famous gym in Detroit that all all the guys go and play. And uh, I make a move, like go to my left. Oh, I'm sorry. I make a move, go to my right. And somebody tries to cut me off, run into my leg. I end up tearing my ACL. Um, and that kind of brought everything to a screeching halt. Uh, I, I think the big thing for me during that time was you didn't have to take an MRI to pass a physical. You didn't have to like go through a rigorous like medical check at that time. I could literally go in, the doctor would see me, check me out. You're good to go. Sign your deal. And I knew something was wrong. I knew I didn't know at the time what exactly what it was, but I knew it was severe because I couldn't play. So I told Billy King, I said, Billy, before I sign this contract, I want y'all to do check me thoroughly. I hurt my knee and I want you guys to look at it. And uh, Billy said, OK, I passed the physical with the doctors. <laughs> <laughs> they said, hey, you got to sprain the MCL. You'll be fine. I said, OK, great. Because I had no swelling. It was a couple of weeks after swelling was gone. And then that night, Billy called me. He was like, you know, I was thinking about it. I think we should just get you an MRI in the morning. I said, okay. I get an MRI, come back to an ACL. And, you know, we had to put the contract on hold. And it took, a, it took me a year to rehab, recover. And um, I ended up signing back with Philly the last couple months of the season. Cause I had to just, I was just was at home rehabbing with, with my own team. And then I signed the same deal a year later in the summer. Um, but I, I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that, you know, we just tried to handle that situation as best we could and, and be honest. I think what's really remarkable about that story is your transparency and then the subsequent transparency and honesty and honoring the contract that Billy and Philly displayed. Yeah. That's, that's super rare. It's rare. He said, he said, look, you earn this and I don't think it's right to not reward you for your contract because you got hurt. And he said, if you prove that you can come back and be yourself, the contract will be on the table for you next year. And and he did that. And I'm forever grateful. Yeah. Um, The other story, which I I don't know how you, I mean, you've told it to me so many times, but I don't know how you feel about it now, but, is the trade story. So I'm just going to (laughs) basically set the table here. (laughs) But again, I believe it's in the off season and you're playing pickup with the guys in Philly and your, your oldest is at the gym with you watching practice and Doug Collins comes in (laughs) and gathers the team together to deliver some news. Yeah. You know, it it was, it was uh, like late August and um, or was it, you know, it was late September, like mid September and everybody's back. We're working out. I'm going on vacation that same day. So I go in early nine, 10 o'clock, what have you. We working out, we playing. And I took my, my oldest son with me because um, we, we're headed straight to the airport after we got our bags in the car and um 
I finished working out and you know, KJ, KJ says, Hey, they, they want to, they want to talk to you up, upstairs before you head out. I said, oh, okay, what's this about? Cause normally in the off season, nobody's calling you in for a meeting. Um, KJ's just like, just, you know, just, I don't know. Just, he, he I think he knew, but he just didn't want to say it, uh, which is fine. And I go, I, I believe it was Rod Thorne at the time. And he was pretty direct and honest, like, Hey, you know, we want to make some moves. We're trading you to New Orleans. Um, just want to let you know. I was like, oh, crap. So I go downstairs and my son is in the gym shooting. Nobody knows what's going on. And Doug walks in and, and kind of brings the team together. And uh, it was a hard moment for him. He, he you know, he's, he got emotional. He's an emotional uh, guy. Yeah, he's just yeah, his he, baseline. <laughs> his baseline <laughs> is to be emotional. Yeah, he, it was pretty emotional. And um, it was shocking to a lot. I, I was just, my head was spinning at that point. So I have no idea what Doug said. Um, my son was, all I could do was look at my son because he was bawling at the time because it happened right in front of him. And uh, he he just was like crying, going nuts. Doug was crying. And, um, you know, that's, that's the business of the NBA. Uh, I still went on vacation and... Instead of returning to uh, back to Philly, I went to New Orleans. <laughs> it just going through those things as a player, I would assume, has to give you a really grounded perspective on the business of things now that you're on the other side and that you're coaching. And certainly you want to develop those relationships uh, as a coach with players, with staff, whomever. But the reality of our league, especially now, it's that it's the the personnel just changes so fast. Yeah, it does. And it's it's really hard to establish relationships and establish trust. And I, I'm gonna touch on that more in a second. But that year you spent in New Orleans, how important was that for you in terms of building that relationship with CP, building that relationship with Monty, which now 12 years later, there's been some, some fruit from, from that. Yeah. You know, JJ, it, I'm, I'm a faith based guy. And, um, you know, the Bible talks about, um, you know, every, everything works together for the good, uh, for those who believe. And, um, as hard as some of those moments are, and you know, you've been through them as well. Um, we all have moments in life where, we're like, what the heck? What is going on? Um, but you go through them. You, 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 you're resilient. Uh, you may not like it, but you try to adjust and have and have a great attitude about it. And it ends up being one of the best things that happened to you. And, and New Orleans was that was the case. Um, that trade uh, was hard. It was hard on my family. It was hard on me. And then I get to New Orleans and, like you said, develop a great relationship with Chris, David West. Monty and I played together in Philly my rookie season, so I was reunited with him. James Borrego, Mike Malone was on our staff. Randy Ayers, who drafted me, was my head coach in Philly at the same time. Um, Jared Jack, Marco Bell. I mean, all these great relationships. Tim Conley, who's the GM um, for the Nuggets. So all of those guys, it was one of the best years, basketball seasons of my life. and. You know, when you look back over your life, that's just it, it, that's what happens. It's like even the stuff that you don't think is right and is not fair and it hurts. It ends up working out to be one of the best things that happens to you. We, we've talked with Chris a little bit about the New Orleans experience. What do you think the biggest difference is uh, with Phoenix Chris now and that Chris back then? I, I, I mean, I think Chris is just at a. Total, totally different level um, than he was. And he was great in New Orleans. He, he's always been a, a, a teammate and a person that connects people. Uh, he, like JC talked about superstars being aware of everything. He's one of those guys that has an awareness of everything that's going on on the team. Uh, and he's just a, a pro. And, and the thing that I appreciate about him being in Phoenix is that He's sacrificing even more to be great, especially knowing his age and how people have counted him out. See, Chris, uh, he'll give anything to be the best that he could be for his teammates, for himself. And um, it's, it's on display right now, and I'm proud of him. 
Yeah, it's, I definitely was talking about Chris. There's probably a couple other guys that I could mention, <laughs> but but we, we 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 told Chris to his face. Like Chris is yeah. a sicko. He's a sicko. He's a he's yeah, an absolute he sicko, and he sees, hears, reads. Uh, he if there's information to find out, he's going to find it out. He's the most observant superstar that I've he ever is. played with. Like he notices every little thing, body language, somebody speaking hush tones in the corner um within a game he notices everything there it just there's just a constant on switch for him i don't know that he has an off switch 100 percent. that's chris and it's it's what we loved about him but some guys it's, it's hard for them to um deal with that i love that about him because it makes us that much better yeah what's going through your mind tell us how you ended up Go into the Warriors. You take the year off. Tara elbows you, uh, tells you yeah. you need to get your life together, yeah. and <laughs> you much. start making the calls. And somehow you end up c- going to a team that had just come off uh, two finals appearances, one championship, a seventy-three and nine year, and then signed Kevin Durant. How did you end up? Just are you the luckiest fuck ever? <laughs> I, I, I mean, I must be, but no, it, it's all. Um, Look, it's, it's, it's definitely part of God's plan, but you talked about relationships. Grant Hill was on the Clippers team my first year there before you got there, JJ. And um, he played, obviously, for Phoenix. Steve Kerr was the GM. <clears throat> I get tra- I get waived from, Orlando, from the Clippers. Orlando picks up my um, contract. So I go to Orlando. Grant Hill and our neighbors. So we played together. Now we're neighbors. I'm li- I live right down the street from, from him. Our kids go to the same school. We're together all the time, the two years that I'm there. I finally decide I'm going to get into coaching. Steve Kerr calls Grant and say, hey, I'm thinking about um, adding a couple people to my staff. I had some people leave. What do you think about Willie? And Grant, you know, speaks highly of me, calls me. And tells me, hey, I spoke to Steve. You know, he's he he may want to hire you. I kind of just wave it off, and I'm looking. I'm going in a different direction. And a buddy of mine said, "You need to get on the phone with Grant Hill right now and get Steve's number." I said, "All right." Is that how it works? He's like, "No, it's not how it works, but you need to do that." I called Steve, and I was in summer league with the Clippers with Doc, possibly getting ready to go to the Clippers, and Steve. Um, he offered me a great opportunity and I couldn't pass up on it. That's how, that's kind of how it happened. <laughs> there was a, uh, we, we spoke after one of the Clippers Warriors games that year. And you said something that has stuck with me for the last five years. You said, this isn't the real NBA. This mm-hmm. is like a dream. What did you, what did you mean by that? You know, <clears throat> I, I, I'm I'm grateful to be able to see what I saw in Golden State. Um, and I think it's what we all as players strive to want to be in an environment like that. And what I what I meant by that is the organization tried to do everything top notch to the best that they could. Whatever it was, um, they thought about everything. Team dinners. Um, families flying on a plane, no matter what, like no, no questions asked anytime you want, as long as there's a seat, um, music playing. But on top of that, all the guys work their tails off every single day. So it wasn't just a, a dog and pony show. It was like, no, these guys showed up every day and they worked. You know, it reminds me of you, but you, you, JJ, you had a routine and you were efficient. It was going to be 25 minutes. And it was like, I'm going, I used to see you at the basket after shoot around. I was like, man, JJ is going hard. And that's, that's how you work. All their guys were like that. KD, Draymond, Andre, Steph, Clay, you name it, Sean Livingston, Zaza, David West. And it was beautiful to see. High IQ guys, all working, all connected at team dinners. Everybody set together, put their phones up. 
families connected. It was, it was, you know, this is not the real NBA. Like this is a once in a lifetime opp- opportunity and I'm going to enjoy the heck out of it. That's kind of how I looked at it. What did you learn from Steve initially? Um, the biggest thing that about Steve is that he's great at, um, I don't like to say managing people, but understanding people, understanding personalities, understanding what people are going through, having compassion, uh, having grace for different personalities, and then how to reel you back in sometimes when you you go astray. He sees it all. Uh, his preparation and his mind, he, 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 he has a brilliant mind uh, when he thinks about the game, how the game should be played. And... I learned really from him, like you can work hard in this league and have fun. It doesn't have to be just, you know, stick within the lines. It's like, no, we can have fun and still show up every day and work hard and be the best team and beat everybody's butt. One of the things that keeps coming up this year when articles are written about you or your players give you or talk about you in in post-game pressers or in articles is like joy and freedom josh talked about it a ton on our podcast um how do you find the balance and steve of course has to do this as well but how do you find the balance between joy and freedom and being loose but also being a truth teller and holding people account accountable and recognizing that this is a results-based business. Yeah, no, it's, it's, that's the hard part, JJ, is, is um, being consistent and finding that balance. Um, but it's, it's really true to who I am. I've always been a guy that I'm going I'm to work hard. Uh, I, I understand when somebody's trying to help me, even though I may not, we, you know, look, our wives tell us stuff all the time that we don't necessarily accept right away, but we know they're telling the truth. Um, but also want to enjoy life. Like, I don't want to show up to work and be disgusted with everything about it. Like, this is such a great platform and such a great opportunity for us to walk into an NBA facility and it's short lived. And I, those are the messages that I give to our team. It's like, look, we, we have to compete. No doubt about it. We have to be one of the hardest working teams. No doubt about it. Um, when, when it's time to lock in and execute, we have to be a team that executes at a high level on both ends of the floor. That doesn't mean this is not fun. All, all of these things leads to joy. When you're working hard, when you're competing hard, when you're with your brothers, you know, those that that's the beauty and that's the joy in it. And so the message for us is simple. We're gonna outcompete, we're gonna outwork, we're gonna defend, we're gonna point five play together, but we're gonna have fun doing it. Um, and every day we come in, no matter what, win, lose, draw, the gym doesn't change. Music is going, guys are working, and we're building our program. How often do, does do you have to raise your voice? Because I feel like the Willie I'm talking to right now is the Willie that I've known for the last decade plus, and I don't know that I've ever heard you speak <laughs> in any other tone. <laughs> There's times, and, and you know, it's not, it's not, it's not, I, I am that person at times because I have to be. Um, our team has to understand that there's, there's sometimes there's slippage and it's my responsibility as, as one of our leaders is to hold us accountable, hold myself accountable because I want to, the, to get the max out of our group. And when we're not doing that, and when we're taking that for granted, that's when they see a different side of me. Um, but that's not often because we got high character guys that care about the game and they care about each other. So it's not something I have to do often, but there's definitely times. I was going to ask, and I know we're going to get to this year in a second, you know, just about sort of keeping the faith really when it comes to the joy coming from a situation like Golden State, you know, with one of the best teams of all time and then Phoenix, you know, top Two, two team in the league. Now you're in a situation with a, a lot of young guys and the guys who are figuring it out and everything like that. So it's the first time as a coach 
you've been you thrown into this a little bit in a situation where it's not all you know easygoing as the as the situations were. What was your what's been your sort of uh, thing you've learned in terms of keeping that level headed sort of sense of joy, especially with the way you guys you know started this year. Well, in, in Golden State, we were it was already high level when I got there. Um, you know, everything was being done at, to, to the to the tenth degree, so to speak. Um, when I got to Phoenix, it wasn't that. And I think people are looking at the Phoenix team that they're seeing now, and they don't see that when Monty and I and our group got there, James Jones, um, we it was it was rough, and we were trying to. Chain. We were still practicing downtown at the arena before they built a new practice facility, and it was it was rough at the beginning. And that's where I learned from Monty, being around him, what it looks like to build. From Steve, I learned this is the highest level. The, this is that's you, the goal. Yeah, that's this, the goal. Yeah. this is the goal. This is where you want to get to. This is this is how you manage a championship team. With Monty, it was this is how you build a foundation, and. I'm blessed now that I can, I've, I've seen them both. And building is different than being at the highest level. Building is everyday teaching, everyday film, everyday um, kind of ha- being consistent. And that's what I'm dealing That's not dealing with, but that is our group now. It's, it's actually Phoenix when I first got there. It's not Golden State. And without having been around Monty, if I would have just came from Golden State, it would have been a lot more difficult for me being and you know de- going through these circumstances. Tommy brought it up. You guys started one and twelve. You're twenty six and twenty seven since then. There's rumblings, Willie. There's rumblings about some Coach of the Year consideration here <laughs> for you. But it, but during that seriously during that one and twelve start, first of all, the the jitters of your first game a new thing, being the head coach, having that responsibility, but then having a one in 12 start. Did at any point you feel like you were in over your head? You know, it, not, not, I didn't necessarily believe I was in over my head. I just, um, I had to do a lot of praying. (laughs) (laughs) Um, it was rough. Not going to lie. Um, but I kept looking at our guys in, in the locker room and I kept looking at them in practice. And um, I started to ask myself, what, what you keep, first of all, when things are going wrong, you want to fix everything. Like everything is wrong. <laughs> so I started to ask myself, okay, let's take three positives offensively, three positives defensively, and let's fix one thing. Like, let's see if we can improve on one area offensively. What is that? It might be just setting screens. And so we would focus for that week on just setting screens, getting open. And then the next week we would add something else. And same thing defensively. It, it may be contesting shots. We got to contest every shot. And I start to learn that, okay, this is how you build your foundation. It's you teach, you teach slowly but surely, you just keep teaching, keep teaching, keep teaching. And I never came down on our guys because he was working their tails off. They were competing. They were playing hard. They were playing together. And I just kept believing in them and believing in us. Like, look, we'll get there. It it didn't happen overnight, guys. Um, But it was difficult. It was definitely difficult. The the other component to this, and and I don't know the exact timeline of Zion's injury and sort of what you knew when you were hired. But, of course, you're taking the Pelicans job so that you can coach Zion Williamson. Yeah. And – the disappointment of not having him on the court this year as fans, we hate it. His teammates, coaches, I'm sure you guys hate it even more. Um, but how have you sort of been able to sort of keep a perspective on that this season? And, and we talked with Josh because we talked with Josh in, in January, whenever it was. Like there was, there was hope for so long. He's coming back. He's coming back. He's coming back. I don't know what his story is now, but with whatever, 16 games to go, it feels like maybe we've missed that window. And so how have you been able to, so as a coach and a leader, deal with that disappointment and then can, can sort of convey that to your team that, hey, we're, we're, we're not going to, we're not going to have this guy. We got to, we got to figure it out on our own. Yeah. I think 
the first aspect of it is we talk about compassion and um, understanding the humanity aspect of all of these of this situation. And nobody is more, I would say, frustrated and disappointed than Zion is because he's going through it. And uh, he got hurt trying to prepare for the season. He was in a gym. He his his weight was down and he was like getting it in and he got hurt. And what I try to get our guys and people to understand is he's 21 years old. Um, you know, JJ, you and I were when we came in the NBA, we were 21, 22 years old, having gone through four years of college. That's different. Uh, so uh, I've had my discussions with him and uh, he's. He's extre- he was extremely frustrated. He's still going through it now and expressing that to the team. Like, look, there's nothing we can do about that. That's a part of life. That's something that he's navigating. Let's be there. Let's try to support him. And, and now this is our group. And I just kept telling the guys, we have more than enough. Simple. And you guys got to believe in, in each other and believe that we can do it together. But – we are all in the NBA for a reason. And when somebody's out, that's opportunity. Who's going to step up and come together and take advantage of the opportunity? And that's the deal for our group. It's, it's, you can't look over your shoulder and think that something like, look, let's go out and get it. Let's go after teams. Let's keep building. Let's keep having fun. Let's keep going out and competing. And it'll all come out in the wash by the end of the season. How important is it to have a guy – like CJ as you're building this thing, this thing, someone obviously with the credibility on the court, but the personality, um, the leadership to sort of be that extension of the coaching staff. CJ is extremely important to building uh, the program that we want to build. He gets it. Uh, He's another guy that's had to go through adversity uh, breaking his foot. He had the same injury that Zion has now. Um, different roles before he became CJ that we're we're all accustomed to seeing is that he had to navigate difficulties early in his career. Um, that builds your character. It just does. When when you're able to do things like that and still be really successful. Uh, JJ, you had to do it. You know, coming in early, every when you were at Duke, you everything was ran through you. You shot the ball 107 times a game. And then, you know, for the first few years in the NBA, it was like, I got to figure this out. Um, But CJ is huge to what we're doing in in the sense that he gets it. He's aware. He's another guy that's aware of his teammates. Um, He's using his voice slowly but surely. And then also having a guy like Garrett, uh, Garrett Temple, um, a veteran who's been on a number of different teams. And I thank him every day because – He's helping me become a better coach, better person um, because I can make adjustments with guys like those guys and they get it. And and that's how you build. you got to have guys that understand that, hey, I may have to, you know, sit you for 10 games or I may play you in this position or you may start or you may come off to like different roles and they can adjust. And it's helpful. We we talk about Bi a lot on the show, uh, Willie. Where do you think his game goes from here? Because from the outside looking in, it really seems like he can do whatever he want on the court, when, like at all times. And uh, you know, the sky's obviously the limit. But what have you seen being around him, even in this short amount of time? Bi is better than advertised. Um, he 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 works extremely hard at his game. Uh, he's he's. I've said it in a few interviews, but he's a coach's dream. I'm get, I get texts in, in the middle of the, of the night. B.I.'s watching film. He's coach, you know, I could do this better. Um, whatever happens, he's he's always – he looks himself in the mirror first. Doesn't point the fingers. Uh, he's a grinder. Um, I can go on and on about him, but he cares about the game. He cares about his teammates. He cares about people. Uh, high IQ, and he's one of the best basketball players in the league, and he's 24 years old. Um, just quick story about him. Like he, at 24, 23, he 
you know, rented a house in Phoenix in the summer. I don't know why he did that. First of all, it was 120 <laughs> degrees every night, every day, but he rented a house in Phoenix. It was his first time doing it. And he just dedicated himself. He said he went three a days, every day, six days a week, put on 15, 20 pounds. And he didn't go anywhere. He just stayed in Phoenix all summer long, every day working. That's dedication, man. I wasn't doing that at his age. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, when I was 23 or 24, I went back to Duke and I basically did that that summer. But that was because I was coming off my second year when I played eight minutes a game and I appeared in 34 games and I was getting ready to go to Russia or some other <laughs> Euro League team if I didn't get my shit in order. Right. B.I.'s been an all-star. Exactly. He's, he's got a max contract. I, I we we've we talked about this a bunch last year, especially when I was his teammate. But he's such a joy to be around on a daily mm-hmm. basis, and it, we always talk about it. Like guys have agendas, you know. We, our Clippers teams, we there were some agendas on that team. Yeah, Bi's agenda is just to play good basketball and win, and he is Sick. he has such a thirst for self improvement. It's so refreshing to see that from from a young guy is there anything about being a head coach you've obviously been behind the bench you've been on the bench you've been a player is there anything about being a head coach that has surprised you either uh the the actual basketball responsibilities the the tertiary responsibilities (laughs) with dealing with the media now and being the face of the franchise like is there anything that's really surprised you about this season it's a lot that surprises me, but the biggest thing is that I have to talk way more, way more than I'm accustomed to talking. And, you know, I'm talking to our team. I'm talking to the coaching staff, performance team, medical team, governing body, uh, media, community events. I'm, I'm just talking. And so I get home and Tara's like, how your day? How, how was your day? And I'm, it was good. And that's about it. I, I'm, I'm done talking for the day. <laughs> uh, it it kind of it just wears you out, but um, it's it's fun. It's all a, a part of what we we have to do as leaders. And um, I'm grateful. I'm grateful to to have the opportunity because you know it's only 30 um, jobs on the planet in the NBA. I mean, that's this, and to think that I'm blessed to have one of them is amazing. You mentioned your your uncle earlier as having a huge impact on your coaching philosophy, your your basketball philosophy. In terms of yourself, did your experience as a player in the NBA or did your experience as an assistant coach in the NBA have a bigger impact on your own philosophy about basketball and coaching? That's a good question. I think I, I, my experience as a player impact has it, impacted me more than my experiences as an assistant coach. Um, when you play, number one, you you have a good idea for the teams that you played on that felt great, and what was it about those teams that you wanted to bottle up? Um, number one was character. It was teams that you played on where all the guys were in it for the right reasons and they all cared about each other and they wanted the same things. Everybody, top to bottom. You, you knew we were in it for the right reasons. Um, I think, too, is competing. Like, are we competing? Are we making each other better? And can we have open conversations and be honest about holding each other accountable in the right way? Like, it's just the deal. Like, that's what the great teams do. And then it's it's just for me it's like moving the ball, sharing the ball, um, defending, uh, being a great team. Even if we don't have great individual defenders, but just playing defense the right way, having each other's back, and then offensively just moving the ball. I think it's beautiful basketball to watch. And so coaching has impacted it a, a bit, but more so just my, my playing experience. Yeah, that's such a great answer. That really is because. In your 12 years, my 15 years, it's not every year that there's something you want to capture. I've been on really good teams, and I'm like, 
there's nothing about that season that I'd like to take home with me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, exactly. But in the four, five years where it's really special and the group is right and you reflect upon that, you're right. There's there's three or four things from that experience that you're like, man, if I could just bottle that up mm-hmm. and I could just take that with me and get to experience that with every group I have, that's the joy. That's, that's the it. joy of this game, and that's the joy of what we do. So I think that's a great answer to end on. Willie, we appreciate the time. We appreciate the appreciate storytelling. You Your perspective is always amazing. And, and for the record, I know I've told you this before, but since the day – uh, you know, since the year you sat out, I've been mentioning your name to any person that ever called about any NBA job ever. <laughs> like, I appreciate it. Front office coaching. I'm just like, Will, no, Willie Green. Who do you oh, think is it? I mean, this you. is before you even were on the Warriors, man. I just, you're a stud, man. I really, one of the greatest human beings in our league. So I'm really Same happy here, for your success. No. And uh, again, I, I know you're going to do big things in New Orleans, man. JJ, appreciate you. You know, we, we feel the same about you and your family. Um, thank you guys for having me on. But JJ's in the one year that we spent together. Um, it was great. You know, that bond created with myself, you, Chris, like all duds, uh, our families. Um, had a great time in Austin. Still one of my, one of my favorite memories there, even though he moved out. Uh, but I appreciate you guys. Thank you. 